All right, I'm going to ask you a question. And this is a tough question, but it's an interesting question. And it's a question, believe it or not, I ask not only of myself, but as a therapist, I sometimes ask clients. Now, not exactly like this, because I usually couch the question somewhat differently. But here's the question that I want you to ask yourself. If God came up to you and he said, become what you believe, how would you respond? What would you become? I mean, the question in itself actually involves a lot of thought. It's like, well, what are you now? Did you already become what you believe? Can you become something different based upon your belief? I love scripture. And I'm going to tell you right now that this is going to be a two-part series, Become What You Believe, part one, and Become What You Believe, part two. Yeah, I didn't say the titles would be necessarily that fascinating, but but the information contained within this podcast, I think you will find very fascinating. Now, I love scripture. I love scripture. I spend my time every morning when I wake up, I grab my coffee, I say hello to my son and my wife, and then I sit back down in bed with scripture and I pray. And I love the questions. And I sometimes find the questions Jesus asks more interesting than what he says. Again, sometimes. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9. Two men are following Jesus. No easy task, right? I mean, they are blind. And he was toward the end of another ordinary, extraordinary day, healing a woman who had been hemorrhaging for years, followed by raising a little girl from the dead. And the blind men kept calling out to Jesus, Mercy, Lord, mercy. And what did Jesus do? He kept walking. (laughs) Can you imagine? You're blind. You're calling out to Jesus. Mercy, mercy, Lord. And he keeps walking. Yeah, you probably feel that way sometimes, right? In your dire circumstances, you're calling out to God. And it's like, why are you walking away from me? Now, he's not. And he wasn't walking away from them. He was inviting them to follow. And that might be what God is asking you to do. He's inviting you to follow. Now, again, did Jesus hear them? Probably Was he too spent and tired to help out another person? No. He had preached for days, and then he would put on a meal for thousands. Jesus keeps going. When he gets home, they follow him in, the blind men. And then comes the question, do you believe I can do this? Now, clearly, they had gone to him and said, Lord, we want to be healed. And he asked them a question. He didn't just say abracadabra or do the sign of the cross or lift his head up to the sky and pray. Not initially. The first thing he did, he said, become what you believe. Do you believe I can do this? And the question is fascinating to me. I mean, it gives me great pause. And it should for you, too. Because what if they had said, well, I, uh, I don't know, can you? Now, the question didn't hang in the air long. They immediately responded, yes, their belief was unwavering. They were fully committed. And what happened? Jesus said, become what you believe. And they were healed right then and there. Now, there are some success gurus and motivational speakers who promote the whole idea, you can achieve anything if you just believe. But that's a lie, and that's not what Jesus is saying. There's no scientific evidence that supports that, and it's certainly not supported biblically. Now, again, as I just said, belief matters a lot. But I can believe all I want. I'm six foot two, 250 pounds, and play running back for the Los Angeles Rams, but it doesn't make it so. See, all miracles reported in Scripture were of God working through the faithful who believed that He, God, could accomplish the seemingly impossible. And to me, again, this is excellent news. Because your faith in you, your belief in yourself, will vacillate and sometimes, if not frequently, falter. What you believe about yourself can change moment by moment. What you believe about yourself and your circumstances can change if you're hungry or if you're tired or if you're stuck in traffic or you just got in a fight with your cat. (laughs) Right? If everything breaks, great for you. 
then you'll be more inclined to believe in a brighter future. Conversely, if you have a bad news, you're tired, you're hungry, whatever, it affects your mood, which in turn can affect what you believe about yourself and your future. But remember what Jesus asked the blind man. Do you believe I can do this? He didn't say, do you believe that you can make this happen? There is no particular mantra, no set of positive thoughts that, can, that could have brought about their healing. It was their believing prayer. It was their faith in God that allowed the miraculous to happen. Become what you believe. Again, I ask you to consider this. Where is your life right now? Where do you hope your life to go? Become what you believe. Not just about yourself. Although become what you believe, I'm going to challenge that whole idea because you do have certain beliefs about yourself based on what? A lot of things based on how you look, based on how people talk to you, based about on your childhood. But we'll get into that. Now, another great question healing time was when Jesus met a man at the pool called Bethsaida. The story is told in the Gospel of John chapter 5. The man had been an invalid for 38 years. That's a long time to suffer. And some thought that the pool had healing powers. Many blind and lame people would gather there near the pools, and when the water was stirred up, they'd race in, hoping to be healed. Again, not an easy task if you're an invalid, because apparently the first one in had the best shot. Now, the man who was an invalid for 38 years was persistent. Now, again, I just want to ask you, when do you feel like giving up? When do you feel like your life is so overwhelming that it just can't change? This man apparently had faith. Now, it might have been somewhat misdirected, and we'll talk about that, because I want you to consider your faith when you consider the idea of become what you believe. Now, the man believed in the water. He was going to the wrong place for healing, but he was about to meet the author and healer of all creation, Jesus Christ. But again, before any healing, Jesus asked him, do you even want to be healed? It's a fasting, fascinating question. And it wasn't rhetorical. Now you'd assume that the man would answer obviously, emphatically, yes, yes, yes. But not so quick. Ask yourself, when you think about where your life is, when you think about where you want your life to go, when you think about do you actually want healing, how would you respond? Do you want to be healed? Yeah, of course I want to be healed. But that's not how the man answered. He began actually with a bunch of excuses. He said, well, you see, you know, when the water gets stirred up, everybody who can walk is faster, they have the right help, etc., etc., etc." And he didn't answer Jesus' question. He just offered excuses why he wasn't healed, why he couldn't get into the water. Now, it's true he did have it difficult. He had a tough time. It was rough. But that wasn't what Jesus asked. He didn't ask him why he wasn't healed. He asked if he wanted to be healed. Now, I want you to pose this question to yourself because the answer might seem obvious. Do you want to be healed of your suffering marriage, of your affliction, of your depression, of your anxiety, of your what? Do you want to be healed? Now again, the man offered excuses. What do you do? What would you do if God said, do you want to be healed? If you go to a therapist and they say, well, do you really want to move forward with your life? Do you want healing? Well, yeah, but, and then you give all the reasons, all the excuses why you can't move forward. Do you want to be healed? Now, how often do you look at other people and you say, well, why don't they just, you know, do this? Their life would be so much better. And again, as the gospel says, it's far easier to see the sliver in another person's eyes and miss the plank in your own. Do you want to be healed? Now, in the world of psychology, this is sometimes called secondary gains. You might be accountable for living your life differently if you are healed. 
And sometimes that's what keeps you from saying, yes, I want to be healed. I'm going to do these things because the truth is you might be comfortable in your discomfort. Do you want to be healed? Well, that might mean you have to get a job. That might mean you have to go back to school. That might mean you have to be kind to your spouse. That might be saying, I'm sorry. Yeah, I do want to be healed. See, with healing comes responsibility. And if you continue to lie on the ground, you won't have to finish the race. And again, running is hard. I run. I hate running. I don't know why I run. (laughs) Maybe I do it because I go, this is really hard, but I feel really great afterwards. There's a lot of reasons. But God calls you to run the race, to win. Get up. Don't make excuses. And when the lame man was done offering excuses, Jesus didn't raise his face to heaven again and begin with a long prayer. What did he do? He commanded the man, get up, grab your bedroll, and start walking. In other words, do something now. You have been healed. Act. And he did. The man was called to act, and he did. And if you want to be healed and live a resilient resurrection life, God is going to call you to act. Again, the questions that Jesus asks, you have to ask yourself, what do you believe about the capacity for your life to change, to be healed? Remember, it's not do you think that you can create a miracle. Do you believe that God can heal you? And if your life does change, are you ready to act differently? Now, back when I was in the police academy, I was a police officer before I was a therapist and all that. But back in the academy, the instructors illustrated the power of belief and its life and death consequences. They showed us video clips of shootings where officers were shot. You know, obviously not the most compelling recruiting video, but we had already signed on the dotted line. We said, yeah, we want to do this. (laughs) And though inflicted with what should have been a mortal wound, one officer lived. And another, though the wounds were not life-threatening, died. Why? Belief. The officer who survived simply refused to give up on his life. Now again, I don't know what kind of religious beliefs the officers had, had, but he refused to give up. He believed he could live. Now remember the man at the pool of Bethsaida? He believed that healing was possible. He held on for 38 years. Become what you believe, but are you willing to hang on? Do you believe that your life can be different? And so began that particular aspect of our police training, right? Survival isn't just about belief, absent sweat, and persistence. That specific training culminated in a day aptly named the will to survive. And and the drill instructors they worked us out beyond exhaustion right right to the verge where you were ready to throw up and pass out and some did and then they put you in the ring and they said okay now you gotta fight and they put big pads on us to, and we had to fight another recruit and it was brutal you had to rise above what you thought your body could do to push on to survival and it took grit and determination and belief Do you believe that you can do this? Now, I could speak of numerous stories of people who achieved unbelievable things because of faith and belief and will. Again, not just the great saints who perform miracles, sometimes even subjecting themselves to torture and sacrificing their lives, but sports teams who overcame huge obstacles to achieve victory. Authors who, despite tremendous rejection and hardship, became billion-dollar writers like J.K. Rowling the author of the Harry Potter series. Before being published, Rowling was turned down by 12 different publishers. And before she even began to write the books, she had spent five years planning the series, mapping it out in great detail. Now again, I don't know the role Faith played in sustaining Rowling through her years of writing and rejection, but what I do believe, however, is that she did not... If she didn't have great belief and faith in her work, she never would have succeeded. If you look at your life, I ask you, what do you believe is possible? Now again, faith isn't the absent of all doubt. 
when you're trying to achieve great and difficult things, there's going to be times when you step back and you're going to say, what do I want to do this? But faith and belief, particularly if you feel called by God to pursue your goal, will give you strength to endure, even when a part of you feels too weak to go on in the face of opposition and setbacks. Again, although numerous decisions affect how your life will turn out regarding health outcomes like genetics and eating right and exercise, belief actually factors in considerably. In one study, middle-aged adults with more positive beliefs about aging lived an average of 7.6 years longer than those with more negative beliefs, even when controlling for current health and other risk factors. Optimistic people were less likely to develop heart disease, again, controlling for other risk factors. See, belief is an acceptance of a claim likely to be true. Optimism is slightly different, could be understood as a tendency to expect the best possible outcome. Matthew chapter 7, 11, speaks about God's desire to give you good gifts. Now, of course, not everything you ask of God in prayer is given to you if it's not going to be good for you. But when you wholeheartedly seek God's will and fight to achieve the good and right, you have a strong ally in God. It's your belief in Him. Now again, belief isn't like having a magic wand. You can't decide to eat a bag of potato chips and a half a pound of bacon every night for dinner and expect a good health outcome. I'm kind of hungry now. (laughs) Bacon right now sounds great. But your positive belief will foster the desire to make healthy choices. Faith leads to action. To live a resilient, faith-filled life, you have to believe But you must also act. Remember the man at the pool. Jesus said, get up, take your mat, start walking. So you can't just sit there and say, oh, I believe, I believe, I believe. I'm spending 24 hours in prayer. Sounds good. But God's also going to say, and now I want you to act. Because you've got to cooperate with that grace. Belief leads to action. God doesn't just push you around. Consider how you might have to act working with God's grace if you want your life to change. Now, a few examples. Luke chapter 5. Peter was fishing with his companions. This is before, right, he was called by Jesus. And they had been at it all night. What one boring fishing trip. (laughs) That's usually what my fishing trips are like. Did you catch anything? No. Anyway, I hate shift work, working all night. I used to have to do that as a cop. But, you know, do what you got to do. They caught nothing, nothing. And in the morning, they were cleaning their nets. And Jesus told them, go back out and cast again. Uh, Master, they said, we've been at this all night. Blah, 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 blah. But if you say so. And they made the extra effort, and they hit the mother load. They filled their boats with fish. It was a miraculous catch. The boats nearly sank because of the number of fish. Imagine their joy. Think world's deadliest catch without the crabs. (laughs) All fish. Now again, I want you to note something important here. He didn't do this at the beginning of their shift. He didn't say, all right, go out. You're nice and fresh. Just cast your nets out. Life will be easy. You'll have lots of fish, and then we'll sell them. No, that's not how it worked out. They had been fishing all night. They had worked really hard. They were exhausted. Now ask yourself, when do you give up? What causes you to stop believing? Become what you believe. Another great story. Jesus was with his disciples. And he preached. And he taught. And he healed for three days straight. Uh, Maybe you should be a little bit more passionate when your pastor or your priest gets a little long-winded. It's like, oh, geez, uh, pastor, that was 15 minutes. Can't you keep it to 10? (laughs) He did it for three days. Now think how Jesus must have felt. But he wasn't done. He looked at the people. He saw that they were hungry. Then he asked his disciples, hey, how much bread do you have? How much food do you got? Eh, We got a few loaves of bread, a couple of fish. 
clearly it was not enough to feed the multitude. But Jesus didn't say, yeah, no sweat, I got this. He said, give me what you have. Give me the little that you have. It was a few loaves of bread, a couple of fish. But it was also all they had. Jesus took it, he multiplied it, and fed them all with leftovers to boot. Now, you are not a God. You can't just will something into existence with positive thoughts. But God of the universe, who chooses to live and dwell within you, to shape your life, he said he offers you grace. And when you couple that with belief, which leads you to act and engage in the struggle, the miraculous is possible. I've seen marriages on the brink of divorce transform into loving unions. I've witnessed people rise out of despair and depression and overcome the debilitation of anxiety. I've seen grief give way to joy. I could go on and on about how I've been witness to people and their transformed lives, but I've yet to see anybody do these things or accomplish these things without changing their belief about what is possible, faith, and then taking action. The Apostle James says, yeah, some of you might say, oh, you have faith and I have works. James said, no, no, demonstrate your faith to me without works and I'll demonstrate my faith to you from my works. In other words, faith and works, works and faith, they fit together. Faith and belief, but you still got to work. Become what you believe isn't just about saying the right prayer. It's about coupling that prayer, that belief in God's grace with action. Now, you might look at your own life and recognize the obvious. You just don't have enough to accomplish what God wants you to do or what you want to do. Just like the disciples, you may think you're inadequately provisioned, and yet he might still ask everything of you. You look at your life, oh, what do I have to give, Lord? I, I don't have anything. Give me what you got. And you give God the little that you have, and you can accomplish the miraculous. But you have to first ask yourself, what are you willing to give? Are you willing to give the little that you have? Are you willing to give all that you have? Become what you believe. What are you holding on to that God might say, give it to me? Your fear, your addiction, your plans. And if you could trust God to make the change in your life knowing you couldn't do it on your own, what change would you make? Become what you believe. Not believe about yourself, but how God sees you. Become what you believe if you know God can do it all. I will meet you back on the road. And remember, always forward.